All right, it is 9.30. want to welcome everybody to episode three of ESO Recapped with Defa Tank, brought to you by Great Architect. I want to thank everybody once again for being here. Just as a quick overview of what we're going to be going over, it's going to be combat detailed, player-created guilds, and we're also going to touch on crafting and what we know about it. First thing we're going to get into is going to be some quick points from um, questions and comments from episode two. Paul Whitehorn from YouTube, he's uh, asking, will there not be any numbers on the UI screen to determine like how much damage I'm pulling or making sure I'm pulling my own weight in groups? My answer back to that is ESO will support Lua scripting so for those min maxers out there who want to get the specific numbers, they can create add-ons to do so. Players will be able to mod their UI to their liking. However, I would like to add that this may in the end actually hurt the majority of players with their experience and how they want because players will be more concerned with the numbers instead of playing how they really want to and watching combat. ESO is more about you paying attention to the in-game world and making appropriate combat decisions through dodging, blocking, interrupts, and CC instead of watching numbers and a rotation cranking out your peak damage. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit and sheds some additional light on that. Jason Johnson from Facebook, he just wanted a simple shout out and Jason I do appreciate you on the official Facebook page for Elder Scrolls Online. I know that you do quite a bit of work over there yourself keeping up with posts and trying to combat in some of these common questions and I just want to give you some recognition. That's Jason Johnson. I'm sure that Zenimax and the rest of the community appreciate you. So let's go ahead and get started with the main points to episode 3. We're going to kick this off with combat detailed. I've just got a video we're going to let roll tonight that I've put together. Maybe it'll go. There it goes. Alright, we're good. So combat detailed. Uh, episode 2, you know, I went into combat generally, um, but didn't really get detailed much with it. Just another quick overview of what you'll expect to be able to use in combat. Again, there's six different weapon types in the game. Two-handed, one-handed and shield, dual wield weapons, bows, destruction staff, and restoration staff. Those are the weapons you're going to see in game. Now I'll get a little bit more detail on this, and I want you guys to pay pretty close attention to the way I say this. If you choose to place any weapon skill line abilities on your ability bar, the weapon you choose to have equipped governs which weapon skill line abilities will be on your ability bar. So just to kind of clarify that up a little bit, if you choose, if is the key word, if you choose to put skill abilities from the weapon you have equipped on your ability bar, they'll be there because you have that weapon equipped. If you don't choose to put any weapons abilities on your bar from that weapon, then there's no need to worry about them being there. This goes hand in hand with weapon swapping, and it's the next point. Players can swap weapons in combat. Uh, this will give you another, another secondary ability bar. This secondary ability bar looks identical, you know, to the first one. You have five buttons on it, one through five and one ultimate with um, a potion. So there's no difference there. But the second ability bar, you can actually load it out with different abilities uh, from different skill lines, uh, whatever abilities you want to put on there. Something to note is you can swap weapons when you want without a cooldown. All right. The only delay that you're going to see in weapon swapping is simply the animation time between weapon swapping. So literally the time that it takes you to pull the bow off of your back and get it ready for combat or to seize the bow and pull weapons out. That's your delay in swapping weapons. 
For toggle permanent abilities like summoning a pet that stays out for an extended period of time, um, if you swap weapons, all right, and that ability to summon that pet, that toggle permanent ability is not on your other ability bar, that pet will disappear. So again, toggle permanent abilities must be on both your loadout bars in order to keep that pet out permanently. For short-term defensive buffs, like say, spiked armor, those abilities will actually carry over as you swap weapons. So if it's something that you cast, boom, you get some armor buff for say, 5 seconds, or 10 seconds, whatever it is. Those types of abilities that are short-term actually will stay active between swapping abilities, so you will not lose those. Players can have two totally different roles or loadouts, whichever way you want to word this, or two very similar loadout or play styles uh, whenever they swap weapons. So what I mean by that is basically you could have your tanking abilities. All right, You want to be a big, big tank on ability bar one. But on your second ability bar, you want to have full-blown healer abilities. All right. It may be something that you swap between, you know, every couple, three minutes in combat. You go between tanking something and then go into healing something or healing your, your friends. Or you could have two very similar abilities with short-term buffs on it, like uh, dual wield, and you just don't have enough s slots, but there's short-term abilities that you want to get these buffs and you're swapping weapons back and forth constantly and you're going to have those abilities on you just have to swap back and forth between the two so again you're not going to know what a person have in, has in those loadouts until they actually weapon swap and you see what they start doing as I said before with weapon swapping no cooldowns this continues on into uh, using your abilities. There are no cooldowns in this game. And just in case anybody doesn't know what cooldowns are, it's basically I use an ability and my character forgets how to use that ability for 5 seconds, 10 seconds, or whatever, and then you can use the ability again. That would be labeled as a cooldown. With Elder Scrolls Online, as long as you have the governing resource for the ability, you can use that ability as many times and as often as you like. Players are definitely going to need to practice resource management All right, for offensive and defensive. I know that some people immediately think, well, okay, I can just go straight up into a fight, cast fireballs nonstop, and kill somebody really quick. It's not really going to work that way. What's going to happen to someone like that me personally, I'm going to see a guy that is just come runs at me with fireballs nonstop. I'm going to play defensive. I'm going to save as much of my resources as I can, let you burn through your magicka, let you burn through your stamina, and once you're out of that stuff, then I'm going to go offensive. You will not have stamina to run. You're not going to have magicka to heal yourself or buff yourself from things. So if you go straight into a fight and you just dump all your resources all at once, you're not going to have anything to defend with. You better hope you kill them if you do it. So you're definitely going to have to manage your resources. Combat awareness. <coughs> Synergies is something that we've not gotten a lot of information about, but I wanted to touch on this a little bit and introduce it. Because it's something that really makes combat and grouping stand out. Generally speaking, what synergies are is an area that a player can affect. All right. Let's say that I put down a synergy of an AOE fire. All right. My friend may see this synergy on the ground and then he can run in and do a whirlwind and there'll be little fireballs or big fireballs or whatever goes flying off of this synergy and starts hitting monsters. That's an example of a synergy. Uh, 
And that's really where characters really, really start standing out, and you start getting the full effects of how powerful your character can be, is when you start using these synergies with a group. And then you start stacking these synergies together, and then you bring in your ultimates. I mean, it, it's going to be really, really big. And that's really where you want to be at, is uh, stacking all this together to do the best that you can do in a group. That really brings out the full effect of your character. On the flip side of things, something to note is monsters will also have tactics like this. They'll be putting area of effects on the ground. You know, they may put oil down on the ground and another, you know, mage-like character will ignite that oil and burn your character that's standing in it. You know, they're going to have very similar abilities like this. So that's something that um, is going to definitely stand out about combat and also taking away from what I mentioned earlier with the rotation stuff and paying attention to combat. You're going to have to watch what these monsters do and how they react to your, uh, your character and combat of your group. Moving on to point number two, player-created guilds. Uh, there's been quite a bit of talk again on uh, the forums and the Facebook page about guilds and player-created guilds. Player-created guilds are in the game. Um, they can have members from all alliances in them. And the reason you can have members from all alliances in one guild is because uh, player-created guilds are account-bound, not character-bound. So when you choose to join a guild with a character, you're joining that guild with your account. So any character that you make, regardless of the alliance, you're going to be able to communicate with those people. Uh, in regards with communication, because immediately the first thing people's going to go towards is, well, that's a free loophole to chat with people in Cyrodiil and give them information about what's going on in the AVA war. Members from all alliances can communicate with one another outside of Cyrodiil, but if anyone is inside of Cyrodiil, you can only communicate with your alliance while you're inside of Cyrodiil. Uh, you're going to have guild stores. Uh, something that was asked actually earlier before I started the stream was um, if you could have a, a worldwide auction house, basically is what it is there's not going to be a global auction house. You're going to have guild stores. And basically what guild stores are is it's where members can list their items they find, whether it be crafting items or just resources that they find out in the world for crafting, whatever. You can list these items in your guild store, and you can also purchase items from other guild members from this guild store. So it's, it's bound to your guild. Um... It, that's going to be a really good system, honestly. A lot of people think, well, I'm not going to be able to sell anything. <clears throat> I don't necessarily agree with that. And a few reasons why I think it's going to be a great system is because it keeps people from having such a monopoly on controlling key items. The value of items may be really high in one guild or really low in another but the thing is you're not going to know which guilds prices are where so it's relevant to that guild and how they're finding everything um, something that you also need to note is guild stores whenever you get into Cyrodiil and this is another thing that goes hand in hand with the previous point I was just making when guilds take over keeps in Cyrodiil and they claim that keep with their guild you will be able to have your goods viewable by non-guild members okay and basically what that means is you have your little group of 10 people in your guild alright and you guys go together and you claim a keep you've got that keep it's yours you 10 people can see all those items once you claim that keep those items that you 10 people have listed on your guild store is now viewable to 
you know, the, the members of the alliance that goes into that keep and they say, oh, I see that guild so-and-so has this keep. Let's see what they have on their auction house. So that's going to keep players engaged with combat and trying to control keeps to ensure that their guild has control of these keeps and has access to those markets and everybody can, can purchase from it. You're not going to have so much of people playing markets at that time uh, simply because I think that these keeps will likely shift not quickly but it will shift over time and the instability of the market fluctuating so much is it's a very huge risk okay. of um, people finding an item that's really expensive for cheap on another guild and being able to flip it instantly. It's going to vary so much. Currently, you can be in five different guilds. All right, so you can join up to five different guilds on your account. Also, currently, the player limit is set to 300. Um, that number was thrown out by uh, Maria Alaprendo at an interview a few months back. She said that that number may go up or down. They're not really set on 300, but she said it's likely to be around 300. So that's a little bit of information about player-created guilds. I will be bringing some more detailed information about player-created guilds as we get closer to launch. But that's just a little bit to get your feet wet with player-created guilds. My third point is going to be crafting. You've got five different crafting types in the game. You've got weaponsmith, which is for all your weapon types. Armor Smith, which is for all of your armor types. Enchanting, which is for jewelry and enchantments. Alchemist, which is for potions. And Provision, which is for food and drink. Some of this information I'm going to be going over is older information. I know that Zenimax has been working on the crafting system, but I think that most of this is pretty much going to apply so we'll, I'm going to go ahead and go over this. Players are not limited to how many crafts they can learn. That is confirmed new information. In the past they were saying only two crafting lines you would be able to learn in the game. They changed that to unlimited and I'm going to go into why they changed that and why it's a good thing. <coughs> Next, crafting is directly tied into your skill lines. This is something new as well. Um, earlier last year, it was more so a secondary game for crafting. And they, Zenimax really didn't feel like it fit their game properly. So Zenimax has redone some things and this is confirmed that it is tied directly into your skill line. So that basically means as you're leveling, you choose you know, skill points where you want to place them, whether it be combat for offensive stuff, defensive stuff, or if you want to put it into your crafting skill lines. So as you're leveling up, you're putting these crafting uh, skill points or skill points into crafting. You're going to have to balance you know, what do you want to level? Um, I know Nick Conkle was talking about trying to balance all of the skill lines, and it's possible. You can master all of this, the crafting, every single one of them. Um, but it's very difficult to master all of them at the same time. And his main thing was it becomes so difficult to hold all of the resources you find for those crafting lines at one time. So I'm sure you're going to see some players that go strictly for crafting and they try to balance all of that stuff. Probably won't really be as effective in combat, but they'll be really good craftsmen. It's not to say you're useless in combat, but you know we'll just have to see how that unfolds later. But you can definitely have all five skill lines if you want to master all five. 
Next, when it comes to starting crafting with your um, with weapons and armor, when you begin crafting in weapons and armor, you will know how to make your races weapons and armor. You will be able to learn how to craft other racial uh, weapons and armor. But Xenomax has not told us how we can determine how to make these other items. No idea how to do it. We're just going to have to learn how that's done. Something else to note is there are no trainers or recipes in the game. All right, And basically what this means is players are going to have to learn how to make things it appears by trial and error and talking to other crafters that's really what Xenomax is after they want that social experience they want you talking to other craftsmen out there trying to figure out how to make these items they don't want you to just go in and say I want to learn crafting weapons one through five I want to craft these five things and get better and I'm gonna go learn six through ten craft those and level it up again and pick 11 through 15 it just keeps going I mean it, it it's not like World of Warcraft crafting <laughs> um, next is ingredients and additives ingredients is what actually creates the item which would be things like iron ore or something of that nature additives is items that you can add to ingredients to give the crafted item additional enhanced properties making it stronger and Paul Sage was talking about crafting and how you can choose how much of an additive to add in you could add too much you could add not enough and it's going to vary with how that item comes out but there's a specific amount that would make it as po strong as it could possibly be so you just can't throw a bunch of additives and be like oh it's going to be great just because I threw 200 whatever into it to make it extremely powerful you've got to trial and error and make what is the best next crafters can make some of the best gear in the game or they can enhance it should be an and really and they can enhance the best gear in the game. Basically what that means is crafting is not useless. <laughs> it, crafters are going to be very well sought out. People are going to want to know what they can make and it's going to be some of the best stuff in the game and I'm sure it's going to be very difficult to get to those levels to make the best stuff. Also, you find something really awesome in a dungeon you can bring it to a craftsman and he can enhance it to make it better. Next point is as you deconstruct items, you're going to learn how to make them. You're going to learn the properties of that item and learn how it's made. So a lot of people is going to think, okay, I'll just get a bunch of axes and deconstruct them and learn how to make the best axes. Well, probably of that specific axe type but when it comes to elven axes you're gonna have to deconstruct elven axes it comes to Nords you're gonna have to deconstruct Nordic axes if you want to learn how to make those I touched on this point just a little bit earlier with uh, dungeon items and craftable items there's gonna be certain items that are found only in dungeons and then there's going to be certain items that only craftsmen can make. Crafting kind of gets the upper hand over this simply because when you find that best item in a dungeon, you can take it to a craftsman and they can make it better. But, you know, that doesn't mean that crafting is going to be stronger than a dungeon item. You know, they're on par. Uh, you can still take that crafted item and enhance it and make it better as well. Lastly, um, I also touched on this just a little bit about talking and socializing with people. Zenimax absolutely understands that crafting guides are going to be made at some point in time. Somebody's going to make a list of items. Here's how to make everything in the game and how to get it, what you need, blah, 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 blah. But that's exactly what Zenimax is wanting 
it creates community driven articles and it gets people talking to one another and reading this stuff and communicating in game something that I found really awesome that came from Paul about getting people to talk he also went on to add that as these people figure this stuff out and they're mastering this crafting they're going to introduce new ways to craft or uh, new items things like that he specifically said right now that there is one way to craft something and this was an older interview so I don't know if this still is true but at that time he said that there's one way to craft a certain item with a certain set of resources but later on they may introduce a way to where you can craft that same item multiple ways and I thought that was really awesome it puts that twist on the item of where you're going to get to the point to where it's like well this is the way you make that item and then somebody else is going to be like no you can make it this way as well and then somebody's like oh well I've got these items over here I don't have the items this first guy said but I do have these second items and you can make that item so I thought that that was really cool and that that gives diversity um, for people to again get into crafting and it's not just a a secondary thing to do that you do at after you have beat a difficult rate or whatever crafting is engaged and it means something and I, I think that's awesome so that's gonna bring us to a close on episode three with episode four I'm gonna be going over leveling questing and exploration Plus, I'll be covering any kind of questions from episode 3 that gets listed on the YouTube replay. You can get that from youtube.com forward slash defitank. Right now, what I want to do, as always, I'm going to open up the Twitch channel to you guys watching right now. And again, I see that I've got some people watching. I very much appreciate you guys being here. If you have any questions over episode 3 and what I've covered right now, please ask. You know, that that's what I want I want user interaction and people to be talking if they're confused on something I want to make sure that you guys are covered good to go so go ahead and ask any questions if you guys have any <coughs> and Jonas he says hey yo your new twitch profile picture is looking hot <laughs> I appreciate the compliment thank you Okay, Voodoo Rattle, he's asking question one. So factions that own keeps basically create an auction house for that faction because a guild that owns a keep gets their bank access to sell to all that faction. So that means that in order to make sure you always have access to the AH, you would need to join a guild in each three factions question mark then he puts in uh, parentheses because a certain faction may rarely own a keep preventing that whole faction from access to an auction house I don't necessarily say that you're going to be forced to join all three factions uh, there are multiple keeps in Cyrodiil there's not just one so one guild will not control who has the auction house um, I can't give a definite number as to how many keeps there are in Cyrodiil I want to say that Zenimax mentioned something about resources and guild um, guilds uh, lost the word guild shops guild no that's not the word that I'm looking for What's the word I'm looking for? Oh my God, I drew a blank. Guild stores. All right. I think, that, I'll start over. I think Zenimax mentioned that resources, taking resources may impact guild stores, but I, I've tried to find that video. I couldn't find it, so I just went with keeps because I know for a fact that they did say controlling a keep will impact the guild stores and who can access it. Um as far as this is where it's going to get interesting I think that players are going to pay attention to what guilds are mainly keeping 
control of these keeps in Cyrodiil, and that's where these people are going to try to get access um, to those guilds. My only big fear is like a lot of guild hopping um, for people that, you know, they've got this one guild that they guild hop on, basically, and they just go around to whatever keep is in control at that time that looks good, and they're like, well, I'm going to leave my guild hop guild and join this other guild because they own this keep. That's more of my fear. Um, but as far as, you know, being forced into joining... Um, a guild with each faction. A again, it goes back to, you know, your character is, regardless of the faction, you're in a guild, all right? So you can be on one character that's Ebonheart Pact that's in Guild A. You log out of the Ebonheart Pact character, log into your Aldemar Dominion, it's still in Guild A. See, Voodoo says two factions may be the powerhouse, thus preventing one faction from owning that resource. So make sure you have a foot in all factions. Yeah, I mean, it. eventually you're definitely going to see, like I was saying, people paying attention to who's controlling what. Uh, the, the thing is going to be, the kicker is going to be the limitation of the number of people that can be in that guild. Um, right now it's 300 and you know for those guild hoppers that just want to jump into whatever guild has control of that keep those people are going to get a bad name pretty quick I, I would almost be sure of that. Um, something else to bring up as well uh, this question came up to me earlier today I was talking about this with a couple of guys in Mumble um, they were saying, okay, what happens if, I, if I'm part of a guild that has a keep and I've listed items to be sold on there and then that keep loses control or that guild loses control of that keep? Do I lose my items or are they return back to me? And the best way that I can answer that is they shouldn't be returned back to you. Um, your guild would just lose control of being able to sell those items to non-guild members. So those items would still remain available to guild members. So Voodoo, hopefully that answered your question in a roundabout way, I suppose. But if it didn't, ask me or say something and we'll clarify it. Okay, Voodoo's got another question. Question two, level 50 plus, and now I'm off to quest in enemy lands. Do I see the enemy players in those lands? Of course, we can't kill each other, but do we still see each other or only friendlies? That's a good, very good question, and that is a question that I do not have the answer to. And even if I did, I couldn't give an answer on something like that. Because <laughs> I know that that is information that's definitely not been given to uh, to anybody. But it is a very good question. And, uh, you know, a question of my own that I would love to have answered. 50 plus content. Do I have to choose one alliance zone or the other or can I switch freely between the two I think the answer is I have to choose one or the other and then do the other one last but you know that's not been given a hundred percent so uh, I would definitely love to know that answer but sadly and honestly I do not have that answer <laughs> Ha <laughs> 
<coughs> I'll give just a couple more minutes here to see if anybody else has any uh, questions or anything that they want to throw in there. Okay, Voodoo also ask. so guilds are cross-faction then, question mark, or we can only join same faction guilds. Player-created guilds are confirmed to be cross-faction. Player-created guilds will have members from all three alliances in them, or they can have it if they so choose. And like I was saying, the reason they are like that is because the the guilds are account bound. They're not character bound. Alrighty, well, that looks like that's the uh, end of the questions. Like I said, for episode four, it's going to be leveling, questing, and exploration. We'll pick up any kind of quick points from the YouTube upload, and um, that's pretty much all I have for this episode. Again, if you want any more additional information about the Elder Scrolls Online, you can visit ElderScrollsOnline.com. You can visit their official Facebook page and their official Twitter. It's right there on their official website. If you've not signed up for beta, do so now. It's right on their website as well. If you want more information about this video series, you can tune in to where you're at right now. Follow this Twitch channel. You'll get alerts whenever it goes live. It happens every Saturday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also visit youtube.com forward slash defatank for the replays. They're uploaded directly to my YouTube channel. Leave comments and questions, suggestions on there, and subscribe to that channel to keep up. And lastly, if you want any information on the gaming community that uh, myself and my friend Seeing Blue founded, you can visit greatarchitect.us. We are a multi-gaming community, and we... We try our, our very best to make sure that you know everybody is happy within that community, and you have players to play the games you like to play, to play with. So, if there's anything else, leave it in the comments section on the YouTube replay. We'll pick it up next Saturday, and I appreciate you guys for stopping by. We'll see you next Saturday.